We are coming for the first speaker, Dr. Mustaqim, and his talk about the uh, hemophilia and the perioperative management. Welcome, Dr. Mustaqim. Thank you, Dr. Yasser. Thank you to the organizers. Uh, I am very delighted to be here and um, happy to talk about hemophilia in terms of the perioperative management. So the first question I wanted to check was, can you see my slides? Not yet, doctor. Now, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. How about now? Okay. Okay, perfect. Yes, we see slides? Good. All right. Fair enough. Well, as as noted, I'm Mustakim Siddiqui. I'm a hematologist for actually from Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota. And I am one of the um, hematologists here at Sheikh Shakbud. And these are my disclosures for research and for consulting. And I basically wanted to give a quick overview of the different types of hemophilia. We're, we're gonna limit our discussion to basically three types of hemophilia. The first of course is inherited hemophilia. This is what we all learn in medical school in regards to um, babies who have a, a deficiency of either factor eight or factor nine when they are born. And as you know, this is travels on the X chromosome. So it does affect um, males. Uh, more than females, even though females can have hemophilia, but more uh, males. And uh, females, of course, can be carriers. Um, the most interesting thing about hemophilia is that about 30% of patients who have hemophilia don't have a family history. They actually develop the mutation um, and it is not passed from parent to child. It is a de novo mutation that gives them hemophilia. So that's 30% of patients. Um, but we'll also talk about acquired hemophilia, which is really around inhibitors. In other words, uh, the, the patient had um, or has the normal genes for making um, uh, clotting factors, but for some reason, an inhibitor has been made, an antibody that then either clears that factor or prevents it from working properly. Um, I have greatly simplified the extrinsic and intrinsic pathway, and it's only because this is the only way I can remember it, um, especially in the context of hemophilia. Those of you who, of course, have um, studied this in detail know this is much, much more complicated, but I've, fa I've basically simplified this to highlight what happens in a patient with hemophilia. So as you can see here on the left-hand side of the intrinsic pathway, you have factor eight and factor nine. They are involved in the extrinsic pathway. And eventually the, the common product between extrinsic and intrinsic pathway is the factor 10 complex. Well, when there's deficiency of factor eight and factor nine, then this factor 10 complex is not made very well. And when it's not made very well, then there isn't a lot of thrombin generation. Well, what does that mean for an individual who has uh, hemophilia? What that basically means is that they do not form clot, or if they do form clot, it is not a stable clot. It's a clot that dissolves very quickly and therefore leads to a bleeding tendency. As you may know, hemophilia is characterized based on the severity, or the severity of hemophilia is based on, on the activity level of the, um, of the factor itself. So, for the most part, hemostasis, it only requires about 40% of, um, of the factor activity. Um, and so if somebody has less than 40%, between 5% and 40% more specifically, that's considered a mild hemophilia. Now, in this uh, scenario, spontaneous bleeding is actually rare. It doesn't occur very often, but patients can have severe bleeding with a major trauma or a major surgery. Those patients who have moderate hemophilia, they have a factor level between one and 5%. And in these patients, they can have occasional spontaneous bleeding and prolonged bleeding with even just minor trauma or surgery. The, the last category is severe hemophilia, and that is where the factor level is less than 1%. These patients are the ones that develop spontaneous bleeding into joints or muscles. So where do people bleed? 70 to 80% of patients will bleed into a joint. Most common are the ankles, knees, and elbows. But you can also you know, often see 
into the shoulder, wrists, and the hips. 10 to 20% of patients will have bleeding into the muscles. And then there are other areas in 5 to 10%. And that includes, for example, the abdomen. CNS disease is in less than 5%. But as you can imagine, a CNS bleed is a pretty um, emergent situation because of the lack of space or lack of, uh, lack of area for expansion and can certainly cause very quick and uh, deadly consequences if there is bleeding inside the CNS. Well, what is the goal of management? And that is basically to restore the factor level to a hemostatically adequate level. And as I had mentioned, you know, uh, previously, we can definitely, we can get by in general with 40 to 50% factor level. So if there is a, a bleeding in the joint or genitourinary system, we will target a goal, uh, a percentage of some, about 50%. But look at muscle intracranial or major surgery. The goal of therapy here is really to go back to 100% factor level. Well, I'm gonna show you this table, which basically is more detailed than the prior table. It tells you the same thing in terms of desired level for different types of bleeding. But the key thing here on this slide is that it outlines the duration of treatment. And this is really important. We'll talk about this a little bit more and give you certain examples of why. But for example, in uh, patients who have um, uh, let's see here, let's pick a good one. Uh, patients that have throat, like neck uh, surgeries, and we'll talk about this in detail. The factor uh, target level is about 100%, but look at the maintenance. It's almost out to two weeks. And that is because a lot of surgeries in the, the throat and the neck do have a incidence of delayed onset bleeding. So several days after surgery, there may be bleeding. Um, and, and that's the reason why there is a, a potentially longer duration of therapy. And the same thing here on, on hemophilia B, which is a lack of factor nine. Um, the target levels here are, um, you know, listed on the, uh, on this column. And then duration is also listed. And it goes back to the potential incidence of, uh, of um, delayed bleeding. So in general, how do we approach factor replacement? It really depends on several things. The first thing we have to think about is the half-life. Now, a little bit of a disclaimer here. There are numerous protocols and factor replacement products. So if hemophilia is part of your practice, be sure to be familiar with your own institution's protocols and factor replacements available. And I'll, and I'll give you a list of, of all the different types of factors and you'll clearly see that having these at your fingertips is, is really helpful. But let's just talk in general of a factor that is not um, pegylated or altered for a longer half-life. In general, factor eight half-life is between eight to 12 hours. And factor nine's half-life is longer. It's between 18 and 34 hours. The dosing formulas are given here. And you know they're very simple. It is the weight of that patient in kilos times the desired rise in activity, the rise. So it's the difference between what you have now and where you wanna go. For factor eight, we multiply that by 0 0.05. In factor nine deficiency or replacement, we simply take the weight and multiply it by the desired rise in activity. Well, if you notice, it does not have a multiplication by 0.5 or half. And the reason is, is because the factor eight has a smaller distribution um, once it's in the bloodstream. The factor nine has a much wider distribution. So that's why the, 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 the dosing formula does not include the 0 0.5. As a general rule, factor eight can, in one unit of per kilo of factor eight will increase the activity by 2%. Whereas in factor nine, one unit per kilo will increase activity by 1%. So I had briefly mentioned there's multiple products. And here's a list uh, from uh, a publication that, that begins to give you a sense of just how many different products there are. 
So the first thing to know is that there are plasma-derived factor seven products. Now, one of the issues with plasma-derived factors is that, well, it requires donors. And um, for example, during the COVID um, you know, uh, pandemic, uh, the donors for blood products uh, you know, had uh, decreased substantially. So you run the risk of not having these products available. Of course, there's also other risks such as infections and things like that. But for the most part, um, the major issue here is making sure you have enough donors. But we also have recombinant factor eight products, and those are listed here uh, on the bottom part of the slide. And you can see a variety of manufacturers that make um, factor eight products in recombinant. Now, the point here is to show you that the half-life is pretty much uh, standard. It's, it's between, you know, basically 10 and 14 hours for these um, recombinant products. But there's also extended half-life recombinant products, and those, those are listed here. And you can see how much more their half-life is from basically 14 hours all the way to, to almost 22 hours. And the way that the half-life is extended varies, but as you can see, half of them here are actually pegylated. So that you know, allows them to, to have a longer half-life. And then a couple of others have um, you know, an albumin stabilizer or an IgG FC portion attached to them, um, basically extending their half-lives. Factor nine is very similar in the sense that it has plasma-derived factor uh, nine products, but also recombinant products as noted here. And you note here that the half-lives are much longer, of course, compared to factor eight. And then to get even more of a half-life, you can see here these extended products and you can see how they're done. Again, pegylation, albumin stabilizer, or adding an IgG FC portion to it greatly um, increases the half-life. Now, these half-life versions may or may not be available um, in your institution. So please look at your formulary or discuss with your pharmacist about you know, these, um, these agents. Well, let's talk a little bit about specific clinical presentations. What if we have a patient that's going for elective surgery and they have hemophilia? How should we approach them? Well, the most important thing, of course, is a GME. Well, that's given. But then the question is really, what is the baseline factor assay? Is this a patient that has mild, moderate, or severe hemophilia? That plays a role into your pre-surgery planning and, of course, your post-op planning. But most importantly, and this is a step that sometimes is forgotten, is inhibitor screening. So if you have a patient that has, um, has inherited hemophilia and has received factor replacement, they can develop antibodies to that factor. Because remember, the factor is a protein and the immune system of that individual can recognize these proteins and develop antibodies. Well, when these antibodies occur, then the infused factor may not give you the intended result. For example, if you calculated that you needed to give a patient 50 units per kilo, if there is an inhibitor, it's very possible that dose is inadequate to get to a hemostatic level. So inhibitor screening prior to surgery is really important. And then really charting out what is the target factor level during and after surgery. As I showed you previously, different surgeries have different targets. Then there's identification of the product, and that goes back to what you have available to you at your institution. And then here, we really want to be able to get that factor in about 30 to 60 minutes before incision time. And the key take takeaway here about giving it early is, we want to check a peak factor level five to 15 minutes after the first dose. Why? We want to make sure that when factor is being infused, we are seeing a concomitant response with increasing factor activity percentage. Because if the patient has an unidentified inhibitor, you will not reach your peak prior to the incision. So this is a critical step and checkpoint to make sure that after inf the factor infusion has started pre-op, a peak level is double is taken and double checked to make sure that the patient is, is achieving the hemostatic factor percentage you want to achieve. 
And then afterwards, we have to talk about, well, what is the plan after surgery? What is the dose? What is the frequency of dosing and the duration? Not every surgery needs uh, prolonged duration after uh, surgery, but some certainly do. All right, well, that's you know, elective surgery. Well, what happens when a patient arrives in the emergency room or arrives into the OR after, for example, a, um, a motor vehicle accident? Here, you don't have much time to wait for factor assay results. So the idea is if you've got a hemophiliac and they have a medical emergency, assume 0%. Assume that they are severe and base your factor replacement calculations on 0%. So what does that mean? That means for patients who have um, CNS bleeding, major trauma, iliopsoas bleeding, because they can bleed a lot in that region, or intra-abdominal bleeding, assume 0%, begin factor replacement, don't wait to pull labs and a factor level. Go ahead and assume 0%. Go ahead and give the factor. And then again, check the peak dose five to 15 minutes afterwards. Again, we also are checking to make sure that we achieve target activity level. And we're also keeping an eye out for potential inhibitors. Very often, this information is not available uh, to, to um, providers, to physicians in emergency situations. Sometimes the patient is not verbal. Sometimes uh, history is not in the medical record. So checking the peak dose is critical. But we also need to check a trough. Four to six hours after uh, the infusion for hemophilia A and about eight, and 12, eight to 12 hours after um, the infusion for hemophilia B. Again, we wanna make sure that we maintain at least 50% um, in, in, in most patients but for those who have CNS, major trauma, um, or intra-abdominal bleeding, you really want to uh, have a trough no less than 75%. Here's some examples of dosing for just general recombinant factor replacement. And here you can see that uh, the initial dose for hemophilia A would be 50 units per kilo. If you go back to um, the slide where I had showed you uh, the expected rise, so one unit per kilo for, for hemophilia A would um, give you a, a per 2% rise, right? So one unit per kilo. Well, 50 units per kilo basically is 100% factor replacement. And in terms of hemophilia B, the calculation is 100 to 120 units per kilo. And if you remember, the rule of thumb for hemophilia B is one unit per kilo rises the factor level by about 1%. We've already gone through what the have lives are. And subsequent dosing really develop, depends on the trough. And you know we're looking to maintain at the least is 50% of the, of the trough, of the factor level. So your target is 100%, your trough is 50%, and your subsequent dose typically is 50% of the initial dose. So if you gave 50 units per kilo um, when the patient came in, your your next dose will likely be around 25 units per kilo. Well, let's talk about head trauma. The most important thing about head trauma is the duration of treatment. This is something that um, really requires uh, insight into the natural history of bleeding. So if the patient does not have intracranial bleeding, the duration of treatment is for three days. However, if they do have intracranial hemorrhage, these require three to four weeks of treatment. And the reason is, is because of the, the, the potential of late bleeding three to four weeks after the event. And that explains why we recommend continuing treatment um, after the acute episode. Well, tonsillectomy is another special case. And it's a high-risk surgery because, of course, this area is quite vascular. But if there is bleeding in this area, there's, uh, it's very quick to uh, potentially lead to airway compromise. And again, in tonsillectomies, there is delayed bleeding um, in these patients. Um, I'm sure many of you have, have had patients who um, day two or three have um, uh, bleeding uh, after uh, tonsillectomy. And that's another reason why here, dosing of factors continued for several days after surgery. Now let's talk about joints. 
hemarthroses. So the ilopsoas and the hip bleed, those are ones where we really want to target a higher factor level. And that's because in the ilopsoas, there's actually quite a lot of space for bleeding. Um, and that also includes uh, the area around the hip. The knee, shoulder, elbows, and ankles, these hinge joints, or at least in the in case of uh, the shoulder, you know, you know, more of a uh, multi-axial joint, we're looking at targeting 40 to 50% factor level. So with that, I want to I want to change gears into talking about acquired hemophilia. Well, as I had mentioned in the beginning, acquired hemophilia is a situation where the individual has all the genes for nor making normal factor, and quite honestly, have there have done so their whole life, but for some reason, they have developed an inhibitor antibody to one of the clotting factors. And most of the time, this is factor eight for, for reasons we don't understand. But when they develop this autoantibody, then they develop acquired hemophilia. Basically, factor eight is either cleared from the circulation or its um, activity is hindered by the antibody and therefore giving you a functional hemophilia. It is rare. It's a spontaneously occurring autoimmune disorder. And, and patients with previously normal hemostasis can develop these antibodies. The factor VIII inhibitors are the most common. And in incidence, is about one and a half patients per million population per year. So it's not very common. These patients can have very severe bleeding and they may vary in severity. Um, the median age is an older population. So 64 to 73 median years of age. And one of the biggest issues, aside from bleeding, is death from infection because of the treatments for acquired hemophilia. As you can imagine, if it's an autoimmune problem, well, then we're talking about immune suppression. And that's where the, the infections uh, can, can be very difficult. So I mentioned that there are autoantibodies, but there, there can also be alloantibodies. And, and let me clarify what that means. So in people who, receive, who, who have factor VIII deficiency from birth and they receive factor VIII replacement, they can develop antibodies to that factor replacement. Those are called alloantibodies. Those are generated because the factor VIII replacement is a new protein and um, the body recognizes it and creates allo antibodies. Well, this becomes a problem when we're trying to make sure that patients who have these allo antibodies get enough factor dosing to prevent bleeding. Of course, for the purposes of our talk, further discussion of allo antibodies is a little bit out of scope. But the second um, category is autoantibodies. So these are antibodies, of course, that the patient's immune system creates. These develop spontaneously. And what these can do is, is really cause somebody to develop hemophilia uh, or develop presentation very similar to severe hemophilia. Here I provided you a graph with the incidence um, and age. And as you can see here, the incidence um, really for, for both male and female begins to pick up in the fifth decade of life and, and really begins to peak in the seventh decade of life. There is a peak for females around delivery, uh, around childbearing ages. So basically early 20s to, to, to 40. Patients can also develop inhibitors around that time. And it happens you know, to be, again, an autoimmune phenomenon. And this is a time of a woman's life where the immune system does see a lot of um, uh, different conditions. Most patients are idiopathic. We have no idea why the autoimmune hemophilia occurred. But you can see here, there is a um, correlation with autoimmune diseases, malignancy, and pregnancy. Those are the more common um, uh, conditions associated with autoimmune hemophilia. But as I mentioned, most of them are idiopathic and they may need severe or, or complicated treatment. 
So here is a great example of some uh, patients who have developed severe ecchymoses from acquired hemophilia. Here you see um, patients in various places, in the neck, in the lower extremities, in the hands, in the arm. And they, of course, present with ecchymoses. They may bleed into muscles. You may also have melanoma or hematuria, or metaragia or epistaxis. You may also see bleeding from the gums. These patients can also have retropharyngeal, retroperitoneal, and intracranial bleeding. And of course, surgical bleeding, especially if uh, screening coagulation uh, tests were not done prior to surgery. So how does this manifest? Basically, pretty big bleeding, about 70% of cases. And in, in one registry, um, they were 73% they were, were, were rated as severe, and 97% of patients experienced life-threatening bleeding. Only about 30% are mild and do not require any treatment. But the biggest problem is most deaths within the first week occur to significant GI or lung bleeding. And if patients do um, survive and get treated, intracranial and retroperitoneal bleeding are significant problems. And unfortunately, bleeding can be fatal in a short order from diagnosis, um, occur in a median of five months after the first presentation if these antibodies are not identified and eliminated. So how is this diagnosed? Well, patient really needs to see a specialist. So if you see a, a patient sees a generalist, we, we would ask for a referral. And basically, we, won't, we don't want to delay diagnosis because, as I showed you, patients within five months could, could die from a pretty significant bleed. And at least in the each two registry study, delay in time treatment was the only parameter that differed between patients who responded to treatment and those that didn't. Now, severity of bleed, and this is a key takeaway for, for the audience, it has no correlation. Uh, severity and risk of bleeding do not correlate with the actual inhibitor titer or the inhibitor level. So for clinical purposes, it's either present or absent. It really doesn't predict what the severity of bleeding might be. So how might we go about looking for an inhibitor? Well, the first thing is, of course, to get the COAG studies. And here you can see, you know, if a patient has a prolonged APTT, of course, we're thinking about um, anticoagulation or anticoagulants. But then the next step would really be a mixing study. And what we do in a mixing study is um, take that patient's plasma and mix it 50-50 with a control um, solution that has normal factor levels. So if the original APTT is prolonged and after mixing, it becomes normal, then this really tells you that that patient's plasma has a factor deficiency. It, however, if the, after the mixing, the APTT stays elevated, then it tells you something different. It tells you that, no, this is not a factor deficiency. There is something else that's causing this APTT to be prolonged. And this is when we start looking at factor levels. So the next step would be checking a factor eight level. And if it's normal, then at least it's not hemophilia, but you might have a lupus anticoagulant on your hand. However, if the factor eight level is reduced, then we're starting to think about an inhibitor. And if it's a non-bleeding patient, you wanna check the factor eight level, consider a lupus anticoagulant. But if they're bleeding, this is where you wanna check for an inhibitor. And the inhibitor is looked for and it's reported as a Bethesda unit. If you've gotten to this point, this is probably the time you wanna call the hematologist and say, listen, I think I have a factor inhibitor and I need your uh, assistance or your consultation. So to re recap, the most important thing is to get a PTT. If it's elevated, do a mixing study. If the PTT corrects to completely normal, then there's a factor deficiency. But if the PTT does not correct to normal, then we're thinking about an inhibitor. And I wanna stress this point. I have a patient whose PTT was 45. We did a mixing study and it corrected to 16. 
Now in our lab, 16 is still prolonged. So even though it went from 45 to 16, it did not correct to normal, suggesting there's inhibitor. So correction from 45 to 16 was not enough. We really need to see it go to normal in order to rule out an inhibitor. So this summarizes basically what I had just uh, described, but in a different way. And so here on the bottom, you can see if the, if the PTT is prolonged, we're looking at acquired hemophilia. But after a mixing study, if it's prolonged, then you've got an acquired inhibitor. If it's correct, then we're really looking at a clotting factor deficiency. But the Bethesda assay is, is basically the terminology for the antibody titer. And these acquired inhibitors, um, you know, they, they tell us how much, but they really don't tell you the potency of the antibody. What's really important is that factor, clotting factor measurement. So you know, getting the factor of, uh, eight. Um, you may see a lupus anticoagulant. Um, and here is where you might see um, uh, a prolonged APTT, a positive Bethesda assay, but a low intrinsic factor level. If you've gotten to this point and you're having difficulties with interpretation, don't hesitate to reach out to a hematologist. Why? Because specific tests need to be done to be figuring out the lupus anticoagulant versus a factor eight inhibitor. So what is the limitation of lab? The auto antibody titer and the factor eight level actually correlate poorly with severity of bleeding. It's because there's a nonlinear relationship between the inhibitor concentration and the residual factor eight activity. On top of that, these levels do not predict bleeding risk. <coughs> Excuse me. And as such, don't use the titer level to make any treatment decisions. So how do we manage these patients? Acute management is really important. If you have somebody who has a autoimmune hemophilia, really getting them over to a hemophilia center or at least an experienced hematologist is really the first step. If untreated, these antibodies will persist. And as you know, patients can die in short order from significant bleeding. And they remain at risk for life-threatening bleeding as long as the inhibitor persists. In a nutshell, this is what we do. We have a two-pronged strategy. The first strategy is to really stop bleeding in case of acute bleeds. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But the second strategy is really trying to eradicate the, the inhibitor. And basically this revolves around immunosuppression. The first step is the controlled acute bleeding. And really it's needed in those areas that I've already highlighted retroperitoneal or retropharyngeal spaces, muscle bleeds with or without compartment syndrome, intracranial bleeding, GI bleeding, severe hematuria, or bleeding from multiple sites. If you've got significant ecchymoses and subcutaneous hematomas, it may not require treatment, but definitely close observation. And in addition to clinical assessment, um, the hematocrit or the hemoglobin is actually a more reliable indicator of significant bleeding than even imaging. Well, trending the hemoglobin or hematocrit is really powerful and uh, does help um, much more than, for example, uh, root, um, sequential uh, imaging. And most of these patients, if not all, should be admitted and monitored at least 12 hours post-treatment to make sure that the bleeding indeed has stopped. So what are the treatment options for patients who have an acquired hemophilia or an inhibitor? Well, basically we have to bypass factor eight. And luckily there's a class of drugs called bypassing agents. There's two that I'd like to talk about. The first is recombinant factor 7A. And the second is an activated prothrombin complex concentrate, or may, many of you will know it as factor eight uh, inhibitor bypassing agent. There's also recombinant porcine factor eight, but um, I think the first two are the more common ones uh, available, especially in the UAE. 
They're all considered first-line therapies um, and alternative treatment strategies amongst the first lines can be used if the initial treatment fails. So for example, um, if you started with recombinant factor 7A and you're seeing that a uh, patient continues to bleed, you are, it is totally reasonable to try an activated prothrombin complex concentrate. If for some reason you don't have a bypassing agent, then um, a factor eight uh, uh, from uh, patients or desmopressin might be an alternative. Now, in terms of inhibitor eradication, this really kind of falls into the um, realm of the hematologist. I'm just going to introduce the topic, but basically what we are looking at is a, a, a stratified approach. For those patients that actually have a higher level of factor eight, we can probably get by with steroids. But for those that have severe hemophilia, we're looking at further immunosuppression with rituxan or cyclophosphamide. In second line, we do um, use rituximab or cyclophosphamide if we have not used in first line, but IVIG itself is not recommended. All these patients really do get some form of immunosuppression. And you just have to be very wise and careful about how you use these drugs. As mentioned, this, the old, this is a disease of an older age population, mid 60s to, to late 70s. And many of these patients can be quite frail. All right, so if you have an inhibitor and you're bleeding, what do you do? Well, recombinant um, activated factor seven, great efficacy, 80 to 100% as a first line therapy and 79 to 92% as salvage. And the efficacy is independent of the inhibitor titer. Remember, the titer itself does not predict bleeding risk or severity of bleeding. And response to treatment is effective or partially effective in almost you know, all cases, 90% of non-surgical bleeds, 86% of surgical cases. And how do we give it? Well, it's given at 90 micrograms per kilo every two to three hours until hemostasis is achieved. And once achieved, then you can start spacing out your, um, your doses. And uh, again, depending on the bleeding, the site of bleeding and the patient's uh, uh, response to, to treatment, it may require as frequently as every four hours, or you might be able to stretch it out to every 12 hours. So what are the benefits of using recombinant factor 7A? There is flexible dosing. Um, if, if it hasn't resolved, then you can uh, redose two to three hours um, after bleeding. Um, it's fairly safe because it's recombinant. There's no risk of human bile transmission. Um, it may be more appropriate in patients than uh, APCC when, especially in postpartum patients, when you want to minimize the risk of thrombosis postpartum. You can use it with antifibrinolytic agents, and there's no anesthetic response to factor eight in hemophilia patients with inhibitors. Well, once you've done that, how do you, affect, you assess the response? And basically, you're looking at, okay, what is the bleeding tendency, size of hematoma, stability of the hemoglobin, and pain? But there are no, but these are the most important, right? There are no laboratory tests that are useful in monitoring the efficacy of bypassing agents. And treatment failure is really defined again on these clinical parameters. Hemoglobin, uh, maybe in, in imaging, uh, especially significant increase in, in dimensions of the bleed or if there's other clinical evidence of continued bleeding 48 hours of after appropriate dosing and appropriate treatment. And um, maybe there's a bleeding at a new site or there's increasing pain. These are the clinical criteria for treatment failure. What about invasive procedures? Well, quite honestly, if it is an elective procedure, it should be delayed until the inhibitor is eradicated. If that is not possible, like it's a surgical emergency or it's a, um, it's a trauma case or multi-vehicle accident case, for example, then basically you need to transfer the patient that has hematology expertise, not only in the factor replacement in patients who have inhibitors, but then how we, um, how we eradicate the inhibitor. And quite honestly, this is a very complicated uh, and involved uh, type of uh, patient scenario. So um, definitely transfer to a, a center that can uh, manage this. Now, 
what if you have um, a minor or major invasive surgery? Can you use prophylactic use of bypassing agents? Absolutely. However, remember that the efficacy of the bypassing agents, while it is very good, you still run the risk of bleeding during surgery. So if it is a um, elective surgery and can be put off, then it is better to go ahead and treat the inhibitor. What about trying to remove the inhibitor? This is again, something that I think is, is thought about, but not really practiced routinely. It in theory is completely possible to go and do plasmapheresis to remove the antibody from the circulation. But the problem with this approach is that it's extremely short lived. So you'll do plasmapheresis, but eight hours later, the antibody will return to a baseline level and the patient will have again, hemophilia. So just to summarize, in, a, in acquired hemophilia, treatment of bleeding episodes, the first line options are recombinant factor 7A or APCC products. Not all bleeding episodes require treatment. It really depends on the clinical presentation, severity of bleeding, and really avoid any invasive procedures um, if you can. Immunosuppressive therapy is really around immunosuppression with corticosteroids, or B cell depletion with rituxan or cyclophosphamide. The problem with immunosuppressive therapy is, is that um, it is associated with you know, death, with mortality. So patients can get infections um, from therapy and that's one of the main limiting issues. So with that, I'd like to close and I'd like to say thank you to all of you for attending today. Um, I hope this was a helpful introduction and at least gives you some, um, you know, points to consider anytime you have a inherited hemophilia and needs factor replacement, or you have a patient that has an inhibitor and um, now needs uh, treatment, whether it's uh, for emergency surgeries or um, uh, in, in, uh, immunosuppression. So with that, thank you very much. And